This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. There's a link below. Rikers Island is famously known as one of the largest correctional and mental institutions in the world. For decades, there has been an outpouring of media coverage detailing a culture of violence and medical neglect that has made the island notorious in the American jail system. With a population of roughly 10,000 inmates across eight buildings, the accounts of those who survive this jail unanimously equate their first moments on the island with one emotion. Fear. Most offenders that arrive at the institution are New York City locals who have a pending trial, serving out short sentences, or are awaiting a transfer to a different location. In the US, jails are typically intended to house offenders for less than a year, with the average stay being only 10 to 20 days. However, in 2015, New York City jails, including Rikers Island, reported an average stay of 176 days for inmates. Many offenders had been held captive without trial for several years. Despite the massive size of the complex and the six month average stay, this location was never intended to be used as a full-fledged prison where extended stays beyond a year would be deemed acceptable. These instances of prolonged detention are the results of trials that are repeatedly postponed and in some instances dropped entirely after years of time served. But the daily tragedy within the detention center itself is merely a piece of the puzzle in what makes this island a dreadful place to visit. Lying roughly one mile into the East River from Queens, Rikers Island gives a clear view of the New York City landscape. Each day, those accused or convicted of crimes who could be as young as 16 years old are driven out of New York City via a single bridge known to most inmates as the Bridge of Pain. Upon their arrival, they're met by a strong and persistent chemical odor. The stench is the result of city waste that was transported from Manhattan to create more than 300 acres of this 413-acre landmass. When the island was being built, city officials made the decision to cut labor costs by having in inmates build their very own trash paradise. As the island expanded, so did the facility. The backbreaking labor from inmates was accompanied by decomposition of trash, which released poisonous methane gas that elicited frequent and spontaneous fires. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, heaping piles of trash were barged onto the island, accompanied by an infestation of rats. In an effort to control the scourge, numerous attempts were made towards population control, courtesy of poisonous gas and bait traps, plus dog, pig, and human hunting parties. Though the trash has since since been leveled and covered with topsoil, high levels of methane remain a serious modern-day health threat to prisoners and correctional officers alike. Additionally, the island's location on the East River has created a perfect storm of heavy air pollution, environmental threats from the shifting foundation, and extreme temperature conditions within the poorly constructed walls of the buildings. The discomfort brought on by these challenges is the lived experience of the inmates and employees on the island today. Long before a complex system of imprisonment was even thought to be necessary, the property of Rikers Island was a mere 88 acres of wasteland, most of which barely peaked beyond the waterline from the East River. The property was purchased by Abraham Riken, a Dutch settler who traveled to the United States in 1638. The island remained relatively abandoned until the Union Army began using it to train new recruits for the Civil War in 1861. On the islands, the training days were long, the weather conditions were harsh, and the food was scarce. Towards the very end of the war in 1865, captured Confederate soldiers were taken to the island to stay in one of the last established POW camps of the Civil War. After the war, the islands lay quiet for nearly 20 years before the Riker family sold the land to the city in 1884. Though it was not explicitly publicized for several years, the commissioners of charity and corrections expressed that they had purchased the islands to replace the dilapidated and undersized jail located on Roosevelt Islands. From that point forward, a fleet of landfill barges would consolidate their trash onto Rikers Island in piles towering up to 130 feet. The landfill existed alongside the construction of the jail and would continue to do so for another 20-odd years. Thomas DeLisa was a sanitation employee for the landfill company who said, Gases were constantly exploding through the soil, covering and bursting into flames. In the summer, the ground resembled a sea of small volcanoes, all breathing smoke. These piles would eventually be spread, leveled, and covered with topsoil until it appeared to be solid ground. The labor, of course, provided by the inmates. In 1933, the first building of the jail system opened. Originally, it was known as the House of Detention of Men and served as a maximum 
security single cell facility that would later be dubbed as the James A. Thomas Center after being renamed in honor of the first African American warden to work in the department. Existing jails in the 1930s overflowed as the city reeled from heavy crime increases due to the Great Depression and Prohibition. The demand for additional cells would rise at lightning speed, and the buildings on the island were thrown up one after another until reaching the present day total of 10 facilities. All right, we'll get back to today's video in just a brief moment, but first, a word from our wonderful sponsor, Squarespace. Now, everyone's out there on the internet, they're making something these days. You've either got an idea for your website yourself, or well, you'll probably come up with one in the near future. Sit down for five minutes, you'll be like, Abby, that's, that's a good idea for a website. When you've done that and you want to make it, get onto Squarespace. And look, maybe you're the hands-on type who's got lots of opinions about what exactly your website should look like. If so, fantastic. Squarespace is incredibly customizable, so you can make a website look exactly how you want it to look. But maybe you're someone who doesn't have a lot of design skills and you're like, oh, if I was designing a website, it's going to look horrible. Don't worry. Squarespace have a whole bunch of fantastic templates. You click on one, you customize it to look exactly how you want it to look, and voila, you're done. Beautiful looking website just like that. And once you're done setting up that website, choosing the name, playing with the colors, blah, 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 there's many extra features that Squarespace provides so your site can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, 24-7 customer support, commercial options, analytics. Oh my God, the list goes on forever. Everything you need is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next web project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, you've got to go to Squarespace. Squarespace.com forward slash geographics will get you 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now back to today's video. At this point, we'd like to invite you on a journey to spend an average day on Rikers Island. You make your way through the Steinway neighborhood of Queens towards the Bridge of Pain, the only means of access to Rikers Island. A sign of the entrance reads, Home of New York's boldest, patrolling the toughest blocks of NYC since 1985. Immediately upon your arrival, inmate processing begins. In some instances, this can take more than 24 hours to complete and involves a cavity search, being outfitted in jail attire, and finally a physical examination and mental consultation. Should you need medications or medical attention prior to examination, such as insulin, it's best to attract the attention of a correctional officer and pray that they meet you with sympathy. Before you find your home among the many establishments on the island, your processing occurs in a series of bullpens. These are literal cages sized roughly 120 square feet. The room contains one toilet with no lid and likely contains the excretions of your peers. Those may be people who are inebriated, detoxing, or severely mentally ill. More than 90% of inmates being detained on the island are male, most of whom are African American or Latino and come from the impoverished neighborhoods in New York City. In recent years, the percentage of detainees who enter the facility with a previously diagnosed mental health disorder has grown to roughly 40%. Which building you end up in on the island will be determined by your age, sex, and able-bodiedness. Many of the men and women being detained are expected to work, while some of them are scheduled to work within the facility doing things like laundry and kitchen duty. Others work off-site on the weekends, where they're ferried to Hart Island, one of the largest mass grave sites in the United States. It is on Hart that inmates are tasked with burying the bodies of the city-subsidized deceased. These are the bodies from low-income families, the unknown or unclaimed from the city, or those that died from disease. This includes a temporary burial site for those who passed from COVID-19. Inmates who are actively working and otherwise thriving in the jail system may only be granted access to recreational facilities such as the library, greenhouse, and gymnasium, so long as they're not flooded. But more on that later. Food, or a very loose definition of it, is provided three meals a day from the mess hall. Those eligible for commissary may enjoy an assortment of packet-style items to be cooked without bowls or other utensils. A popular luxury meal on Rikers Island is that of ramen noodles known to the inmates as crackhead soup. Sleeping arrangements vary between crowded group rooms, dormitory-style shared cells, and solitary confinement. When being processed as an inmate, you're gifted with a four-inch thick mattress, a pillow, and a blanket. Several inmates have sued the jail over the abysmal sleeping conditions, which caused them horrendous pain and referred to it as cruel and unusual. While the argument is flimsy, much like the mattresses, some of these cases have actually won in court. If you're staying in the jail during the summer months, you may be exposed to oven-like heat conditions. Less than a quarter of the buildings on the island equipped with air conditioning, making it nearly impossible to find relief. In winter, the frigid temperatures can be equally unbearable. What we've just described is that of the average day for a model inmate. While we'd like to assume that you would remain on your best behavior, should you find yourself getting wily with a correction officer, fellow inmate, or perhaps you just looked at an employee a little too intently, your day looks drastically different. 
Better known to the public as solitary confinement, punitive segregation is a disciplinary measure reserved for inmates who cause disturbances, need additional protection from other inmates, or are considered a danger to others. The punishment includes isolation in a 6 by 8 foot cell for 23 hours a day. Your head rests frighteningly close to your toilet. Meals are provided through a service hatch, and you are denied all except very basic hygiene products. Physical and mental stimulation are difficult to come by, as such many inmates who are kept in punitive segregation admit to engaging in self-harm disassociating, painting on the walls with feces and other bodily fluids, screaming for hours on end, and initiating fights with staff members. Another popular pastime, especially in inmate isolation, is an activity known as splashing. This involves filling up an empty carton with urine or whatever fluids you happen to have available and launching it out of the service hatch at correctional officers as they try to keep their composure. The frustrated cries of your fellow inmates persist throughout the night, though the only company you find is in the tired eyes of the correctional officers peering through a small window in the door as they conduct regular suicide checks. There is a reason that the New York City crime scene is such a topic of interest in the media. From bootleggers, mobsters, to New York City club kids, Rikers Island has seen it all. From the year 2001 until 2009, there were 246 instances of death from within the walls of the jail. Of those deaths, 182 were from a medical condition, infectious disease, or medical neglect, 12 were direct homicides, 28 were suicides, and 16 were accidents. Only one death was officially deemed as a complication of care, and there were seven instances where they could not term in the course of death. Later, the New York Times performed a four-month investigation on Rikers Island. Among their findings were 129 cases of assault on inmates spanning the first 11 months of 2013 alone. 80 of these 129 inmates were interviewed by the health department, and the findings were that more than 60 of them were beaten after being detained. Then in 2014, the city's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene conducted an investigation which deliberately addressed the treatment of mental illness within the facility. They noted that nearly 77% of those that were seriously injured within the confines of Rikers Island were diagnosed with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or other forms of mental illness that the staff were woefully unprepared to deal with. The issue of sexual assault within U.S. jails is well known, but the Rose M. Singer Center, the women's facility on Rikers Island, is considered to be one of the nine worst jails in the country. 8. 6% of incarcerated individuals make reports of sexual abuse from other inmates, correctional officers, and doctors, which is a stark comparison to the national average of 3.6%. In recent years, the number of inmates being held within the jail had decreased drastically, yet there was a notable spike in violent incidents in 2019. Violence between the inmates increased to nearly 70 incidents each month for every 1,000 people being held at the jail. This is in comparison to only 56 monthly incidents per 1,000 people in the jail in 2018. Not only were the number of incidents higher, but those involved were also more severely injured. The amount of officers being assaulted by inmates increased more than 3% from the previous year, and the use of force by correctional officers against the inmates jumped 30%, particularly against adolescent inmates. Based on this statistic, U.S. Attorney Preej Bahara stated, Simply put, Rikers is a dangerous place for adolescents, and a pervasive climate of fear exists. Though the first rule about Fight Club is that you're not supposed to talk about Fight Club, we're going to talk about it anyway because it's just too interesting to leave out. The program was a club that was established by three correctional officers who instructed juvenile inmates to exercise excessive violence and extortion from their peers. The aggressors of this club were referred to as the enforcers and were typically after the pin numbers and commissary luxuries of their victims. Not only was violence encouraged against their targets, if an invitation to join them was extended to you, it was do or die. Such was the fate of an 18-year-old awaiting trial for a minor parole violation who was bludgeoned to death for declining to participate. Up until this incident, the jail claimed this club was a rumor fabricated by the media. Afterwards, however, investigators spoke with the teenage inmates specifically about their involvement and knowledge of the program. Of 250 boys, 60 of them admitted to either being a participant or having been victims of these enforcers. 190 of those questioned confirmed that they were aware of it. Despite all of this, it is possible to leave Rikers unscathed if you're equipped to navigate these complex social structures. The threats of the environment, however, are unavoidable. As a reminder, the foundation of the landmass itself is built from leveled garbage that has been decomposing for nearly a hundred years, so it should come as no surprise that the foundation of the island 
is questionable at best. As the trash below putrefies, the ground shifts and sinks, making way for a host of other issues. Ground settlement causes movement in the island that is unpredictable and threatens the pipework buried underground. As the pipes rearrange to accommodate the movement of the foundation, they are prone to cracking or breaking apart entirely. Repairs can cause water supplied buildings to shut down for 24 to 80 hours as repairs are made, which cuts off access to toilets, showers, and the drinking supply. On the surface, the buildings are not immune from the effects of the sinking foundation. As the ground settles inconsistently, a corner of the building may drop, leaving the ceilings and walls cracked and crumbling. Not only is this damage unsightly, it also allows the inmates an opportunity to get creative in fashioning weapons from the crumbling structure of the facility itself. In 2014 alone, it was estimated that nearly 80% of the weapons were sourced from raw materials made from the building itself. In particular, aging radiator pipes and plastic light fixtures were used to make shivs and shanks. Overall, as the structure of the building leans and drops, it further aggravates the issue of internal flooding and building destruction. As a low-lying island on the East River, the amount of water on Rikers is contingent on precipitation, tides, and the direction of incoming storms. When faced with heavy snow and torrential downpour, up to five of the buildings regularly face severe internal water damage. Critical roads on the island have also been known to flood, cutting off access to the urgent care facility. Natural disasters are also a force to be reckoned with, particularly as hurricanes travel up the coast. While recent hurricanes have come and gone without any exceptional danger, evacuation plans involving Hurricane Irene in 2011 and Hurricane Sandy in 2012 have posed questions about the plans for Rikers Island evacuation if it became necessary. Imagine that after being held captive in solitary confinement for several years, you are finally released and eager to take a deep breath of that sweet, sweet freedom. Freedom, which in this case smells of noxious gas and may trigger an asthma attack. As methane belches from the grounds below, there are other toxic elements contributing to the poor air quality. On one side of the river, there are five power plants located in Queens that play a major role in the local air pollution. As fuel is burned within these power plants at a high intensity, nitrogen oxide is formed and released. At the same time, the fuel that is unable to burn within the engines produces volatile organic compounds. On the other side of the river, we find a compressor station, four ways transfer stations, and thousands of diesel trucks that make their way through the Bronx on a daily basis. Located directly on the island itself, the Rikers Island power plant is responsible for a massive outpouring of greenhouse gases. To their credit, the island switched to a cogeneration power plant system in 2015 in an effort to reduce the 127.1 million pounds of carbon emissions being reported from the island in 2014. Long-term exposure to this toxic environment is not only damaging to the atmosphere, but can have serious health risks associated with the respiratory and central nervous system. Rates of asthma in the areas surrounding these plants, including Rikers Island, spiked dramatically due to the influence of the smog. Statistics that roughly 10% of the inmate population on Rikers Island are suffering from asthma, with many recorded instances of the condition developing during their stay. In 2011, numerous correctional officers sued the city, claiming that inhaling the carcinogens on the island directly contributed to their cancer diagnosis. That island is toxic, and it's killing people, said one of the officers. I spent 20 years being exposed to what's in the grounds and air there. My life won't ever be the same. As you might have guessed by now, Rikers Island has created quite the name for itself in the United States jail system. Conversely, there has also been a heavy focus on reform in New York City, as the current mayor, Bill de Blasio, has made efforts to make changes and work towards smaller city jails in the future. Given the concerning nature of the islands from the grounds up, talks of closing the facility and repurposing the lands have been in the works for several years. Rikers' notorious reputation for violence and neglect has grabbed attention on more than one occasion, and in 2019, New York City lawmakers makers voted to initiate the process of closing this jail for good. Without being able to pause the New York City crime scene, the closure will have to be implemented gradually and deliberately. It is currently predicted that the institutions on Rikers Island will be closed by 2026, costing the city a whopping $8 billion as it prepares four new jails located in Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx and Queens. The new institutions will house significantly fewer inmates due to aggressive criminal justice system reforms and a dwindling crime rate. These reforms have been received with mixed reactions from the city and correctional officers tasked with keeping order in the jail. It's still unclear what the island will become once the jails have been successfully relocated, though there have been a number of proposals made to the city that lead us to believe that the life and legacy of Trash Island will carry on.
So I hope you found today's video interesting. If you're interested in jails, you might also be interested in crimes. And I have another channel called The Casual Criminalist, which is a true crime show. So it's all about the sort of people who end up in a place like this. You can check it out through the link in the description below or just search The Casual Criminalist on YouTube or it's also a podcast. Search it on a podcast app and you'll find it. And thank you for watching. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. Before you leave, let me tell you about a new channel that I'm doing called Into the Shadows. So maybe the world isn't dark enough for you. Well, good news, it absolutely is. And if you'd like to know more about the horrible things that humans have been doing to each other since, well, time immemorial, well, please check out that new channel, Into the Shadows. From landmines to penal colonies to horrific diseases, if it's horrific, we cover it. Check it out through the link in the description below. Again, it's called Into the Shadows. And thank you for watching.